Hi, welcome to Conversations. I'm Bill Crystal, and joining me today, I'm very pleased to have joining me, is Erwin Stelzer, economist, contributor to the Weekly Standard, Public Interest, and many other magazines. My favorite economist. Oh, well, that's, that's with, high praise indeed. Damning with some kind of praise. <laughs> I don't know if you want to be considered my favorite economist. And my, you're my favorite economist because you both defend, you make the strong case for the importance of economics when people are being economically literate, and then you spend half your time explaining to economists the limits of economics. Right. So. Explain those both to me here. <laughs> in 90 minutes, explain. In 90. Okay, well, economics. We'll get to it, right. Well, basically. It well, works, doesn't it? I mean, at it, the end of the day, markets, well, competition. Yes, at the end of the day, markets and competition work. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have perfect markets or perfect competition. So in the real world, what you're dealing with is uh, inclinations, uh, tendencies. You're not dealing with hard and fast conclusions, as you can see from the mess we're in in healthcare and almost every other thing you mentioned. Econ economics can tell you how to create incentives to good behavior. Uh, they can tell you what incentives to bad behavior can do. Take Wells Fargo as a good example. Uh, and they can sort of lead you to ask the right questions if um, laced with a significant amount of humility. I mean, I'm curious. You were your PhD in economics, but then you were in the business world for the right. most, almost all of your right. adult life. Yeah. Which influenced you the most, or is it a combination? Well, of the I, two, I think there were three things. Uh, first of all, what I learned mostly in graduate school. Uh, I had a great mentor, Alfred Kahn. Uh, very exciting. Uh, I had an exciting graduate career. I got to teach nine hours, work for the 20th Century Fund, grade papers, and take five seminars and get the PhD done in two years. So wow. it was very intense, and I, like I learned graduate, a lot. Really, yeah. yeah two well, you, years, really? Wow. Well, you probably liked hanging around campuses. Totally, you know? yeah. I, I did not. Easy. You were not. I wanted to the, get back to New York. You were not York. sitting in the cafes no, enjoying. No, no, yeah. I wanted to get back to New York about as fast as I could. Um, and then I, I, I learned in business that uh, a lot of what I learned in economics is true. Uh, if, if you reward people every quarter, uh, they're not going to make any investments uh, because they're going to want to maximize whatever they produce in a quarter. So uh, I, I think it was a good combination. And then, but the third part, uh, and this is not to flatter you, but um, when uh, at some point in the 80s, when I uh, had sold my business because I spent 25 years doing um, – wage reviews for hundreds of economists, each of whom had his own theory of wages, and I decided that's not for me anymore. Uh, your father said, why don't you come down, you've made enough money, come down to Washington, I'll get you with the AEI, uh, and uh, you'll uh, really thrive there. So I went down with a whole bunch of free market stuff, I was gonna stay a year, and then I ran into your father and your mother, all of whom questioned everything I said uh, and introduced what I considered non-economic considerations. Uh, and I said, no, oh, I don't want this slippery slope. I like really what I got. I, I know if I raise the price, the amount of demand is going to go down. I'm happy with that. Uh, and then I had to think a lot about it. And I emerged from that uh, really quite different from what I went in. So it was a combination of the three things, kind of education, running a business, and then getting exposed to a whole different way of thinking about poor people. There's deserving poor, there's undeserving poor, uh, and, um, and that changed me. And I think that's where I am now. Uh, who knows what will happen, who I'll run into next. No, and I think what's so interesting about your work is you try to think about, let's call it democratic capitalism as right. a whole not just about is this market imperfection that right. can be fixed in that way. Right, well I think as you get from, uh, let's say from liberal, when you get mugged by reality, as your father said, but when you get to conservative, you have to ask yourself, what am I conserving? Uh, I don't much care about the environment really, uh, which is what conservationists think about. You're trying to conserve free market democratic capitalism. Once you decide that that's the broad goal, uh, then, uh, then you're let loose because the specific things have to fit into 
where they go. And the, so you, the, you get away from pure efficiency arguments. I mean, I could tell you what the most efficient way to organize anything is. But then you get to, the, you get to distributive justice and equity and all the mushy stuff uh, that, that makes decision making much harder. And I suppose the real world itself makes decision making so much harder, right? I mean, you, you were an antitrust specialist and yeah, it, I mean competition, uh, how, how different, I guess I would say if a PhD, if someone got a good PhD in economics, understood right. presumably all the competition, market, supply right. and demand, price discovery, I don't really understand mm -hmm. most of these things, but all right. these terms. How far off is that person going to be when it comes to Washington and is set, told, hey, figure out what the right policy should be in this area or that area? Well, it, it, it depends on, I've hired a lot of those people because I used to hire people by seeing who was writing doctoral dissertations in the areas I was interested in and then calling them up and say, how'd you like to come to work? Is that right? Yeah, that's how I did it. I wow. studied the list of dissertations. And so I got them when they finished their dissertation, um, sometimes not, uh, and, um, now they were confronting reality. Right. And reality was much more complicated. I mean, I could tell you, for instance, that it's important, as economists say, to internalize externalities. Right. Okay? If I turn on my electric and I pollute the air, uh, I should have to pay for it. That's, I mean, you can say that in a paragraph. Okay, how do you measure the social cost of what you're doing? Well, now you're in a whole different area. Uh, and. Um, it's that, but still the basic idea of asking the right question is what you could come out of graduate school with. And one of the things when I was at the Kennedy School, uh, uh, Bill Hogan, who's one of, you know him, he's a very right. fine professor, always said, if you ask the wrong question, you're gonna get a silly answer. Uh, when the governor of New York said, can I evacuate Long Island if Shoreham nuclear plant blows up? Well, the answer to that is no, but it has no meaning. Uh, the question is, what is the probability that that's going to happen? What can you do to change the probability? Uh, uh, that sort of thing, and that, that's much harder. I don't want to talk about some of these particular areas of competition, externalities, sure. and, uh, democratic capitalism, but just looking at America today, we're speaking in what, late June 2017, which worries you more, that people don't get the basics of economics, of markets, of prices, kinds of things that really are important to have a you right. know, increased prosperity and and a f and functioning economic system that's produced wonderful things for right. um, so many millions, hundreds of millions of people, on the one hand, or that people are dogmatically attached to a kind of free market orthodoxy that doesn't let them think more creatively about the broader society of democratic capitalism that we need to preserve and about some of these compli complex issues of social externalities and so forth. Yes. Both. <laughs> <laughs> they both worry me. Uh, I would say in the practical world of making policy, the second probably is, is more worrying because uh, people, I mean, what is there in economics? You raise the price, you sell less. Uh, you grow faster, you have more money. Uh, it doesn't take a whole lot. You know, I think all these fancy get, terms like price discovery and all don't do much for you. Have you looked at a journal no. lately? No, uh, no that's not, not that's, my thing. I, mean, I, I look at them. Yes, you, know, you do. I'm very always impressed. You occasionally send articles from some. Yes, and uh, you know, and they're useful because <clears throat> they refine how you think. But I think the real, as I, the real world problems today are uh, trying to find a middle ground. Uh, I think I mentioned this before between. Uh, uh, foolish consistency and sheer ad hocery. Uh, trying to find, you don't want people lurching from one thing to another, which politicians tend to do. You know, they wake up in the morning and Is Nancy Pelosi thinks we're gonna kill a million people tomorrow, or, uh, uh, you know, or, or the president uh, thinks Amazon should go to jail. Uh, that kind of stuff is very bad, but it's equally bad to say, well, look, Adam Smith wrote about free trade. Free trade is good. That's a good thing. Don't tell me about tariffs. Don't tell me about currency manipulation. Don't tell me uh, about retaliation. I don't want to hear that. Uh, I can show you which page, and Adam Smith supports free trade, and please don't turn it over, because on the next page you're going to find qualifications that are going to make you crazy. Well, let's, I want to talk about trade, but let's just talk about, you cited Adam Smith now, which is not, it's, most economists have a sort of, you know, a hat tip to someone like Adam Smith or Ricardo, but of course everything, they've really just read modern economics, you right. know, beginning and whatever, and the latest journal article. I mean, you really do go back and read the earlier economic thinkers yeah, very seriously. Well, I, I read them because, of course, it's very good. 
I mean, first of all, it's beautifully written, and that's one test. I mean, I, I'm a great fan of Keynes, Keynes the writer. I'm not so sure about Keynes the economist, but Keynes the writer. And also, he, he asks himself very hard questions uh, and sometimes gets murky answers, but uh, I, I think all of that is, uh, it's grist for the mill. And then you've got to say to yourself, okay, uh, that's what he said. Uh, that's very helpful. It helps me frame the way I look at the issue. Uh, and now what do I do? And I think... I can't imagine, for example, um, people uh, who haven't read Marx or who haven't read Keynes or who haven't read Smith and taken it seriously. That doesn't mean you've got to be a Keynesian. But on the other hand, uh, when you're listening to, say, Larry Summers say that we ought to do this and this and this, uh, and you say to yourself, well, what did Keynes say about that? Well, Keynes said that, but not quite what Larry's saying Keynes said. Uh, it helps you analyze what's going on. And think more broadly, I think, because they were all sort of interested in political economy. Yes. Well, that was the original name of, of my not racket. Not in mathematics. Yeah, that it was, was political the, economy, right? Yeah, it was political economy. Uh, uh, that was the racket. And it was before uh, a specialization, very narrow specialization, you know. Don't ask me about GDP. I do labor markets. Right. Um, and before mathematics, which is, in a way, uh, a substitute for thought. It's by... if. If you can't say it, then you don't know it. Uh, and if you make it so abstract that only, uh, I mean, what do you do with mathematics? You, you exclude as much reality as you can in order to get precision. And precision is, economics is not about precision. But I think the discipline's gone in that direction, huh? Uh, oh, Since has you it ever? With Fred Kahn, Look, I mean, well, uh, when I uh, no, you see, I snuck out of graduate school before the wave of right. mathematics. In fact, the debate in the department in the year I left was: Do we buy a calculator, or do we hire another secretary? <laughs> so that might tell you how old I am. Uh, but I escaped it. I don't think I could get a PhD today. Uh, I couldn't even come close, given the demands of mathematics. First of all, I wouldn't be interested, and second of all, I wouldn't be competent. And what does it really tell us much? I really wonder. Well, um, it, it, look, it tells you something. Uh, uh, take, take model building, for example. Uh, model building, uh, which is based, it can only be based on historic data. Of course, there is no future data, or else you wouldn't be building the model, right? <laughs> so, so you take uh, data and you try to look at it in a way. Now, what it lets you do is answer what if questions. In other words, what if the economy grows at 3% instead of 2%? What does the model tell you? And then you look at it and say, does it make any sense? Um, but in terms, I mean, we've had experience with uh, model builders predicting and uh, there's always something you forget. For example, uh, quants who came to Wall Street and were going to predict stock prices and so on forgot one thing. They were all going to make the same prediction at the same time because they built the same models. Uh, bad things started to happen. So uh, uh, they're useful, uh, but I think um, not as useful as uh, people who swear by them. It's like climate models. I mean. What do they do? Look at the range of answers you get. Right. And that's fine. It, it tells you, so you, then you try to make your own judgment. Well, if this and this happens to temperature in the next five years, what does that tell me about what's going to happen after that? It's useful to ask questions, but not to build policy on. Yeah, and you always emphasize, I was like this in your writing, a certain basic humility or modesty in well, terms of what we can know and how much we're going to get right, and that that almost has to be built into the decision-making, no? Yeah, it, 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 it does. I, I, I haven't been accused of humility before. No, I know. That's very well, yeah, kind of you. You're, you're, uh, uh, you're a not-so-humble advocate of humility. That's, right. that's what I think of it, <laughs> which is the best kind, really, that's you know? Uh, I, I think Isn't there Benjamin Franklin is like one of his... Uh, I don't know. It's it could like be. Be, proud of, you know, be proud of your, your, your humility. humility, something like that. But, but what the, I mean, humility can be paralyzing, and you have to avoid right. that. Uh, but what you have to do in the process is say to yourself, okay, I'm going to be wrong. Now, the question is, let's say I'm forecasting energy demand. I'm going to be wrong. Um, the question is then, uh, which error is the worst one to make? Uh, somebody's asking you, should I build an electric generating plant? So you do a projection of demand. You say to yourself, it's going to be wrong. The question is, should I build it? Uh, should I build it too soon, right. or should I wait for a shortage? 
Well, then you say to yourself, which is worse? And so you say, okay, I'd rather build it too soon and bear the carrying cost. So I think what you have to do is say, I'm gonna get it wrong, probably get it wrong. The question is which of the errors I can make is the least costly, uh, and then use that to begin to think about the policy answer you wanna get. And think about it in healthcare, think about it in anything. You're gonna, we're gonna get it wrong. When you're trying to guess how many millions of people are gonna to respond to what kind of policy, uh, <clears throat> we're gonna get it wrong. So the question is which is the least costly error we can make? I mean, I was, when you've written for us on climate change, carbon tax, um, many times at the Weekly Standard, I, I've gotten responses. On the one hand, people outraged that you're somewhat dismissive of the, not dismissive, but skeptical, I think, of the mm -hmm. confidence of many that uh, we know where the climate's going, <clears throat> we know how severe the crisis is, and so forth. Right. Uh, but on the other hand, you're a very strong advocate that happens for a carbon tax, which is a favorite of a lot of the environmentalists. Right. And people sort of said, well, how could he be both? I thought he was a, he seems like a climate skeptic and then he's for this carbon tax. Well, so maybe that's a good example that's you a could good, walk people well, through. I mean. Well, he, he, you're looking at climate change. So they build these models and they tell you all sorts of things are gonna happen. Now, the first thing you've got is you've got to control your temper because <laughs> if you don't agree with them 100%, uh, you're a denier. And I hate that term because it comes out of the Holocaust. Yeah, uh, it's a terrible term. And I told them that, and they keep using it. So you say, okay, I don't like these people. But nevertheless, I got to look at what they say. And it doesn't look to me like what they're saying is plausible, that the world is going to come to an end, and uh, especially since it's an invitation for more government. So the people right. who are doing it have an incentive. You always got to look at what the incentive is of the person who's making right. the position. And so his incentive is to expand government, and naturally he wants regulation. So then you say to yourself, well, but I could be wrong. Now, let me see. If I'm wrong and the globe heats up, uh, that's not a reversible error. That's, that's an error. You can't buy a fan and cool the globe down. Uh, you're done. Uh, so maybe I'm wrong. They think they're right. They know they're right. I think I'm right, but I'm not sure I'm right. So then the question is what policy is appropriate that will do the least damage if I'm wrong? Well, we should do something as costless as we can to reduce emissions in case they are being generated by human behavior. Well, what's the most efficient way to do that? Now there an economist can be helpful. Uh, you can say, well, I have regulation with hordes of people at the EPA who have a stake in continually expanding regulation because then they get to hire more people and uh, get bigger budgets? Or what happens if you just uh, uh, take these costs, whatever they may be, and they're very hard to measure. They have costs on health, they have costs on congestion and all sorts, and you measure them as best you can. You're probably off by orders of magnitude, but you get a number that's not zero. And you say, well, now I have a number that's not zero. Why don't we start slow? and uh, make sure that we have a flexible program. Uh, and so you say a carbon tax is the most efficient way to do this. It will restrain demand a little bit. Uh, it will it, uh, compensate society for the costs and we can raise it. So let's start at $20 a ton and see what happens. And then you say, well, wait a minute, who's gonna pay this tax? Who's it gonna fall on? Now you notice that um, liberals can be had more easily on gasoline taxes right. because they live in cities and they don't drive. Right. Uh, and they have big limousines. And they don't think you should drive either. They, they, <laughs> and they come out west where you know my, my plumber has to drive 40 miles to work in a pickup truck. Uh, and, they, they don't, and he's gonna end up paying the tax. So then you gotta say, well, what is the equitable way to distribute this burden? Well, let's see. I, you don't want poor people to pay more than rich people. Uh, so we'll make an adjustment. Anyone under X thousand dollars a year uh, will get a rebate on the tax. And so then, then the policy fight starts. But at least you're starting from a basis where whatever you do, it's going to be a better thing than doing nothing. Now, Ronald Reagan said don't just don't just do something, stand there. Right. And sometimes that's a very good policy. Uh, but in the case of global warming, if you can't be sure you're right, 
and I'm not sure I'm right, although I'm very skeptical, and I'm trying to discount the nastiness of the other side uh, and the certainty of the other side. I mean, you see John Kerry, he really knows. What does he really know? He doesn't know anything. Uh, he, he, you know, somebody told him. That's, they don't even quote their own stuff right. And then when you see added to that, they try to repress the other side and keep them out of the learned journals, you've got to be suspicious. But you can't be sure you're right, so you do what I said. And it's also the question, I suppose, just to take another minute on climate change, which is an interesting topic. There are ways you could imagine the globe getting warmer. It has, and presumably mm -hmm. will. Uh, and adjusting to it in ways that don't involve right. stopping it from getting it warmer so much as just adjusting to right. warmer. Well, warmer, yeah, right? yeah. I mean, first of all, there's winners and losers from warmer. Right. Uh, there's this town in Britain, Blackpool, which has probably the most horrible weather in the world. They're now talking about becoming the Riviera. <laughs> okay, now, they ain't gonna make it, but it gives you some idea. If you're a farmer in Canada, warming is not such a bad idea. Right. So first is winners and losers. And the fact that uh, 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 somebody is uh, trying to stop that process from winners and losers, that's true of every economic decision. So you say to yourself, well, okay, if there's winners and losers, now let's see what the magnitudes are. But then second, you say, well, wait a minute, would it be cheaper to build a dike. Right. Would it be cheaper? Now you're in Miami, uh, where we have friends, uh, and uh, the town is built on very porous stone, so that when the floods come, it comes right up the sidewalks. Mm -hmm. It's not like Manhattan, which mm -hmm. has the hardest stone in the world. That's why we have skyscrapers. Uh, and so you say, well, that's really tough, but yet in some towns they've decided they're gonna raise the sidewalks, uh, why did they decide that? Because property values were being threatened by this threat. Well, that's good, that's what markets say. Uh, that's gonna threaten property values, makes you willing to invest to preserve your property values, and that's a perfectly normal capitalist free market reaction. So uh, you've always got to say, is it cheaper to ameliorate uh, the cost of this? Oops. Now, you gotta be careful when you say that because that leads you to, is it cheaper to let this person die than to treat him? Uh, and there you don't want to necessarily right. <laughs> go that route. So that's why, that's why policy making is so much fun. Yeah, no, this has given a wonderful example. Now you said in passing, but I want to draw you out a little on this, that you know, we, the choice would be thousands of EPA regulators or mm -hmm. uh, simple carbon tax. How much does the study of economics bias one, I don't mean that in the sense of the bad sense, but or uh, instruct one to be in, in favor of price type solutions, if that's the way to say it, <clears throat> as opposed to regulatory solutions. It, it, yes, it, it clearly, it, if you're smart, it clearly makes you start there. Uh -huh. uh, you start saying, I'm in favor of market-based solutions. First of all, there's a freedom element to that. Right. People are free to respond. Uh, and it worked very well, for instance, with the Clean Air Act, uh, where we internalized the externalities and people responded. Uh, but on the other hand, for example, uh, if you take um, a situation, let's take, take the automobile industry, or as Henny Young has said, please, the uh, innovation-averse industry until it got foreign competition. There was no force on earth that you could get them short of regulation to do certain things. So in the end, you say, well, it's true if we raise the price of gasoline, they should make more efficient engines, but they don't. So let's have a dollop of regulation here. So you can't, you can't not regulate. Uh, there are some things that uh, you've got to take account of, and there are some, uh, some things where, um, uh, well, uh, Take Florida, again, you were at a meeting with me in Florida, right. uh, and everybody was all worked up about how a carbon tax was gonna make everything wonderful and stop the Everglades, I think they're called, that mushy stuff down with the alligators or the crocodiles or whatever it is. Wonderful, irreplaceable wetlands. Right, right, the right exactly. Oh country. God, why anybody would go there. But <laughs> in any event, uh, and everybody was all excited because some of the uh, congressional people were all for carbon taxes. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, but the, but the wetlands are different. I mean, we want to regulate and, and right. prevent this from happening. They may be right. I mean, there may be no way you can get uh, enough of a price re a response to price to 
to avoid a lot of social harm. So in that case, you regulate. Uh, and and the, the interesting thing, I've been around regulators uh, all my life. They are basically honest, uh, honorable people, the exception of some people at the EPA who are not. Uh, and, um, and they try to do a job. And their job, as they see it, is to emulate what a free market would produce and then add equity, uh, which is it's not a bad goal and it's an honorable profession. I don't want to leave here think, letting anyone think that regulators are bad guys. Mm -hmm. There are bad guys. Mm -hmm. uh, but basically, regulators, there's a wonderful book by McCaw at Harvard um, uh, reviewing five regulators, including Fred Kahn and so on, and their contributions to society. And what Fred tried to do was set prices that would have been the same as what a market would do. At the same time, he understood the limits. Uh, I remember uh, he, I called him up one day and, and I said, what are you doing? He said, you're not going to believe what I'm doing. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm defining a sandwich. Where, I, what, he's in government at this point. He was in government. He was at running the Civil Aeronautics Board. And they knew that one of the problems, which regulated, were, which regulated all the airplanes, regulated fares, regulated where they could fly, et cetera. And one of the problems they had was because they had to pass on costs, the airlines were insensitive to costs. So somebody before him had put a rule that in economy class, you can only serve sandwiches to prevent costs from going up. Turns out they were putting great big steaks between two pieces of bread and calling it a sandwich. And that's when Fred said, we got to turn out the lights and get out of here. I can't do this. So, and he did do that. was and a he huge did. He closed, he closed. Yeah, that was it. Success, right? Well, yeah, and Basically it's interesting. Success. He, had, he mean, had great support from Ted Kennedy right. for that. Uh, some people say because he flew from Los Angeles to San Francisco for $25 in a, a, a startup that was having the, the hostesses in hot pants. But that's not verifiable. Yes. Uh, so, it's um, a non economic incentive or something. Uh, <laughs> well, I leave that to you. Yeah, let's not. We don't, we don't want to go <laughs> let's not go that right, far. Right. But um, so, again, it's particular to the circumstance without becoming a complete ad hoc solution. You start with a prejudice in favor of markets, uh, you move from that to deciding uh, whether any sort of price solution will help. Um, in housing, we got all the incentives wrong and got the crisis in 2008. Uh, almost every economist saw what was going to happen, although they didn't say it. I mean, because they were looking at models of it rather than looking at the micro incentives being built up in the housing industry. Uh, that an economist can do. Uh, and then you proceed to, well, if, if, if I can't get that done and this is the way it's going, and this is necessary to preserve free market capitalism, then you begin to make exceptions, just like we have now this problem with inequality. Technically, you could say, well, it'll work out. I mean, basically, the unskilled will learn skills, and as I, I think I said to you, you know, economists can tell you where you want to be, but they can't tell you how to get there from here. And we can't figure out how to get to the level of equality we want to do, so... It's hard. It's I mean, hard. It's hard. Yeah, that's a good. That's a good lesson for people in policymaking. I want to come back to both the 08 crisis and especially the inequality issue today, and mm -hmm. technology destroying jobs and so forth. But you said very quickly, in, in passing, almost the auto industry was resistant to uh, uh, competition from outside. So, but I guess the normal, if I can put it that way, sort of orthodox free market economists say, "What do you mean that they're they're competing with each other? These companies, if if what you say is right, all, all three of them." So yeah, you. I would say generally, you maybe this is your real world experience has made you more of a doubter about competition in the real world than yeah. a lot of economists I read who just assume, well, uh, several companies, so competition, this is the yeah. price that's being driven by competition. Yeah. I don't think you that, think that's that, always That the, can often be wrong. Um, that, first of all, there were only three of them. And it does, you don't have to have a meeting to decide what you're going to do. I mean, so that's why you we... look we, at we, each other's prices. Yeah, right? uh, yeah. and also th there's a... Um, you know, you're all members of the same club, and Dearborn, I think that's a place in Michigan, mm -hmm. uh, and so on. But take, take our friends, the real red-hot competition people in Silicon Valley, right? This is the, yeah, let's talk about the liberal people who want more visas so they could bring in people. Steve Jobs said, if you, pack, if you take any of my employees by paying them more, I'm going to ruin you. 
So they all agreed to, and I'm not saying any, this was found in court. They had to settle this. They fixed wages by agreeing not to compete for each other's staff. Um, and they had to pay a huge fine. Any other cartel like that, the guys would have gone to jail. But, um, and, uh, and, and, and Jobs, at one point, uh, the interesting thing was the, the then president of, uh, oh, was it Google, uh, sent a, uh, an email around saying, let's not leave a paper trail. Uh, tells you about his high tech capabilities. <laughs> let's not leave a paper trail. Uh, no, leave an email trail. Uh, and um, so you have to look, and that's the ethos of that industry. They feel somehow that it's perfectly appropriate. This is my person, and you have no right to take him. And in fact, one human resources guy at Google got fired for hiring away one of Steve Jobs' people. Um, and this is all in a court record. I mean, so not telling anything on the tales out of school. Um, so again, you have to look at the practices in an industry. That's rather important. Um, there are people now who worry about Amazon, for example. I worry less about Amazon because they have such a small part of retail business. Uh, but I could see the worry. Uh, you can see the book business, you can see businesses where they have had a major effect. Uh, and then you say, well, is the efficiency gain worth the effect? And if it gets to be a real monopoly, at that point, you have to regulate. I mean, it's very rare that just free and open competition produces a monopoly. We thought that was true in the airline industry, in the electric utility industry, in lots of industries where it proved not to be true when we deregulated and we allowed competition. The it that wasn't true was that it was a, quote, natural monopoly. I mean, yes, yeah. they called it natural monopolies. Now, again, I remember when I was at AEI, um, generation of, of electricity proved not to be a natural monopoly. People built generating plants, they competed to get to market. Transmission is a whole other story, and one of my economist friends there said, but sooner or later somebody will develop alternatives to transmission, which undoubtedly true. Uh, but then you ask yourself, well, is it sooner or later? Right. If it's going to be in a couple of years, well, then maybe you just let it rip. If it's going to take 20 years because of the huge capital investment and the permitting problem and all the institutional barriers to entry, uh, well, then maybe we want to regulate it. You mentioned the 2007-2008 mm -hmm. financial crisis, which certainly is, was the most dramatic I've been through. Right. And, uh, did shake one's my faith in economists, and I think the public's faith, actually. I think we've seen the consequences of that in Europe and in the oh, U.S. Sure. over the last decade. Um, was it predictable? Did people predict it? I, what, what, I, well, what, answer, what does one learn looking back, et cetera? What well, one learns looking back is, number one, a macroeconomic model can't predict turning points. Very good at trends, uh, but turning points are very difficult. So just explain that a little. So you mean well, if, if it was obvious it's going that at some up, point it was going to... At some point it was going to go down. I mean, you didn't know when or, or how fast. And it's very hard to build a model that's based on the going up to figure uh, when it's going to go down. But if you looked at it in a, in a micro way, look at the incentives that were at work there. Number one, thanks to conservatives, we built into the tax code a, uh, an incentive to own a house, right? You can deduct your mortgage. The theory was absolutely perfect. It, it's, it would make for a more stable society. People with homes, you know, what, what is it? Larry Summers said, you, nobody, nobody washes a rental car. Um, this would be, forget about that it, it froze the labor force, especially in a downturn where the people couldn't sell their houses, but never mind, it's a good thing. Yeah, good, things, good things turn out to have some bad consequences. Yeah. That's well, but one then of the, the main liberals, rules that you, I think, right. uh, you know, stress, right? Right. The liberals then went one better. Well, if housing ownership is really good and you give people deductions for mortgage, what about people who really can't afford it? Let's find some way to get them houses. So you get this panoply of assistance to people who have very little chance of paying back their mortgage. Then along comes the guy who's going to lend the mortgage, right? Now, he would ordinarily have an incentive to get paid back, right. but he ain't hanging around to wait to get paid back. He's going to bundle it into a bunch of securities and sell them to somebody else. What's his theory? Well, if I take all these bad debts and I roll them into a security, that will spread the risk 
and therefore that's a triple A rated security, says the rating agency. Forgetting that, what's going to affect one guy who can't pay his mortgage back is going to affect another guy who can't pay his mortgage back. And then the guy who wrote the mortgage, he doesn't care, he's gone. And you what about the buyer? Why isn't this buyer saying, what am I buying here? Because he's told that he will get bailed out, he has the impression that no one's going to foreclose on his house, he's got a protected position uh, from the government that sounds really I guess great. the ratings agencies, they and were the pretty rating, important in that, right? The, I mean, yes, the rating the fa agencies. The false reassurance of... Yes, they said to investors, this is a triple-A rated security. Right. Uh, now, remember, that. look at the incentives. The rating agency didn't get paid unless the deal went. So the security that they rated AAA was the thing that generated their own fee. If they said, oh, this is a lousy deal, don't sell the security, they didn't get anything. Hmm. So we now have a situation where there was no regulation making the original writer keep skin in the game, which would have at least moderated his willingness. And then we add to that the notion that we pay the bankers who sell this stuff uh, bonuses based on short-term performance, and we don't claw back any of those bonuses that are based on earnings that really weren't there. Now, we've moved ahead a little on that. At Wells Fargo, they're clawing back some of the tens right. of millions of dollars of the fraudulent sales. Uh, so we had everybody had an incentive to do the wrong thing. Uh, <clears throat> and look what happened. Uh, but if you went to your model and said, is the housing market going to crash? Well, you put in all these old data, and it didn't tell you that. Yeah, that's so interesting. And I, I guess what's the phrase? The crises happen more slowly than you expect, but then more suddenly or something like right. that. I mean, you, that does need to be true in life, I think, so often. You know, you hit these <laughs> inflection points. Or, yeah. Uh, and it, it, look, again, if you think about it, so what do you do about it? Okay, yeah. I have all these incentives are wrong. So can the markets fix, can market action fix the incentive? Well, no. Uh, what you really should do is, first of all, the rating agency shouldn't get paid right. on that basis. Second of all, you should have, the guy who writes the mortgage should have to keep some skin in the game. Uh, and a whole bunch and of- Some people were saying some of these things as public yes. policy matters, right? In yes. In 05, 06, 07. Yeah, I mean, but, but look, but no one people were making a lot of money yeah. at this. Uh, and, um, and the consequences, a lot of the consequences, were externalities. If you had a foreclosure on your block, your house was worth less, even if you're paying your own, your, your own mortgage. So uh, it, it just, it was a bad set of incentives. How do you fix it? Well, then we go to the macroeconomists, right? And we go to the Fed. Fed sees the world is coming apart. Uh, you're the Secretary of Treasury. Somebody says, well, you better bail out um, Goldman Sachs. You better let them become a bank, because if they go under, you're going to have a problem. Well, you don't like to do it, but you say, fine. And then Lehman Brothers comes along and says, well, what about us? That's enough. <laughs> we don't want to create moral hazard. Right. And moral hazard means we give you an incentive to bad behavior. Too bad for you. We know you're small. Oh. But it seems you're also interconnected somehow that we don't understand in the banking system. And we still don't understand in the banking system. We understand size. We do not understand the interrelationships in the banking system. Who, when drowning, reaches out and pulls somebody else down with him. Uh, Aren't so, there ways you could regulate the banking system to try to limit the ability of yes. one entity to drag down another. Yeah, you could, there are ways, and we've done some of them. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, th yes, there are ways. Uh, most of them are imperfect, but there are ways. One way, which we've used a lot, in, uh, is to have the banks have lots of capital so that they can't be dragged down because they have plenty of capital to throw at the problem. Uh, and we've got a much better ba capitalized banking system with uh, capital determined by the risk at which your portfolio is from the interrelationships. So that's good. I mean, that's better than, than we had before. Um, you could limit the size of a bank. I mean, there, there is a point beyond which humans can't manage something. Um, and uh, you could say, well, you're a smart guy. Manage this much, and then you can't grow anymore. That's a way to do it. 
Um, or you could say, well, if you want insured deposits, that's your business, right. period. Don't take on a whole bunch of risks that will make the insurance company pay if you go down the tubes. So there's a lot of, but that's regulation. You can't rely on markets to do that. That's a big topic today, obviously, both income inequality, questions about upward mobility. Um, those seem to be perhaps more damaging to the system than, mm -hmm. you know, it says that the incentives aren't quite right, or maybe even than the after effects of 07, 08 at this point. So right. how worried are you about that? Are you, I'm, I'm a lot worried about it. Is that right? Okay. Uh, more uh, than most conservatives, I would say. You know, if, yeah, more than most conservatives. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm worried about it for a lot of reasons. Um, first of all, uh, we, if we have a system where it is, um, it seems that performance and pay have become disassociated at the very high levels. Right. Um, so, uh, and I think that's bad for the system. Um, so I, I worry about that. We also have a system where uh, inequality is now worrisome. And it's worrisome for a lot of reasons. One is there is a uh, feeling that uh, compensation and performance have become disconnected. Um, you know, I mean, Warren Buffett is very good at the avuncular game, so nobody begrudges him. Right. His, and also he's done very well for a lot of people. Uh, <coughs> but uh, there's something going on out there that's sort of troublesome. And um, I don't think it's, it's mere envy. I think that the system is... Um, throwing off casualties of change uh, where people who are not responsible for the change uh, and uh, have no way of adjusting to the change. You know, you're, you're sewing T-shirts in North Carolina and suddenly somebody in China can do it for a dollar an hour. Uh, you paid your taxes, you scrubbed your children, you sent them to school, you went to church, and suddenly your living is gone. Um, and meanwhile, I'm getting a cheap T-shirt. Uh, there's something wrong about that. Now, I'm not a moralist. I mean, if I were, I would have lived a different life. But uh, the, uh, there's, something, there's something upsetting about that in terms of the preservation of the capitalist system. Uh, what do you do about it? Well, there are income transfers that you do. We do some of that. Um, there, uh, but we haven't solved this problem. And when, it, when, it, uh, when industries are localized, so you have coal, where the coal is. I mean, you don't have coal in, you know, uh, in downtown Aspen. Right. Um, so where it's localized and it hits a whole community so that you can't say, well, why don't you go to work? Why don't you take a job for less money in the department store? But the department store has gone bust because right, you no don't have money. There, right? We haven't solved that problem. And it doesn't get solved by mere transfer payments uh, because the transfer payments then become multi-generational. And um, it, yes, the economy is doing great uh, in a way. I mean, we have low unemployment as we measure it. Um, it's really not that low, but it's low as we measure it. Uh, the economy is growing. Is it growing 2% or 1.7? I always... I'm amused, you know, I, I, I think decimal points were invested to show, invented to show economists have a sense of humor. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, it's growing modestly, uh, not a lot, could grow more, might grow less, but we haven't solved the distributional problems. And the distributional problems become multi-generational so that um, it isn't the case, well, you know, sooner or later the guy will learn how to become an airplane pilot and give up his horse and buggy. It doesn't work that way anymore, right. if it ever did. Uh, and, um, and I worry about that. I don't think we've solved that problem. And how easy is it to solve? I mean, maybe we have pretty unusual, I guess, uh, combination of globalization, especially China, it seems to me, right. which is just a massive shock to the system. Many good things come out of it, including what's happened in China itself, which is not a trivial accomplishment of a kind of capitalism, you know, bring mm -hmm. hundreds of millions of people up to a decent standard of living, but 
you combine the China shock with the technology shock, mm -hmm. and maybe it's just something that you know no one can, knows much how to deal with. But well, um, well, there are way. I mean, yes, and we've had shocks before, and the economy seems supple enough right. to to adjust to them. So we've got a system of um, temporary transitional transfer payments that are supposed to cover a permanent system. At 26, remember 26 weeks of unemployment right, insurance, right, right. right? You're between jobs, well, you're gonna find a job in 26 weeks, well, if it's not 26, we'll make it 50, we'll right. make it 99. Right. But basically, these are transitional circumstances. They aren't anymore. Some of these are permanent. And the question is, what do we do? I'm not talking about a permanent underclass in the Marxian sense, but what do we do about that? Um, it, it seems to me that uh, if at the same time as you're doing nothing about it and the upper income earnings are less related to some economic activity that people can understand, right. not running a hedge fund or pretending that something is a capital gain that's ordinary income, <clears throat> you get pressures on the system. And Look, this is the greatest economic system ever invented, not because of the goods and services it produces, but because of the freedom that it has produced that's associated with it. And that's not new to me. I mean, everybody, anybody who read Milton Friedman and so on knows that. So the question is, that I worry about now is, how, what do we do about that? Uh, what do we do about essentially what looks to me like a permanent underclass. You're 50 years old. We've managed to fix it so you're going to live a long time, which at some point you may wish you weren't. Um, and uh, your coal mine closed. You're going to send it to computer school? Uh, it doesn't make sense. Are you going to arrange a permanent lifetime stipend? That doesn't make sense either. Uh, and I don't know the answer to that, but I know we're not asking the that question at all, because the political system, which runs on um, getting elected every other year, uh, doesn't seem capable of coping with this kind of problem, which may require rather long-run solutions. Uh, and, well, you're a political scientist. I'm not, so... Yeah, well, uh, you know, the same the, thing with incentives. I mean, the system... The founders did try to set up a system in which some people would take a longer view. The Senate has six-year terms right. and so forth. The president, Hamilton explicitly says this in the Federalist Papers, is eligible for re-election, and they didn't anticipate even a two-term limit. Because you want to give the president an incentive, right. Hamilton says, to launch long-range projects. Right. Which, and you want, you know, with Reagan, you, he had the toughness to go through the, right. the, the, the Volcker contraction right. in 82 because he knew he wasn't up till 84, and that if he right. could make it there, he'd probably hit another right. four years after that. But yeah, so it's, it's an interesting political science question of incentives, too, as well as an yes. economics uh, question. And, but it seems to me on that 50-year-old man, I mean, I think it's very different if he thinks, look, I might have kind of gotten a bum, you know, fate here, and that's not new. There were plenty of people in 1932 who had been working hard and suddenly found themselves in know, the Dust Bowl or something in Oklahoma and never really probably got up to the standard of living right. they had in 1928. They went to California or something. But they did believe their kids would have right. a good chance. And I think that's what's a little scary. I mean, Bill Galston always cites this poll, I, I'll get it slightly wrong here, but sometime around 2012, 2013, when for the first time, a majority, or at least the plurality of Americans, uh, said they were not confident their kids would have a better chance right. than they. Right. And that is worrisome. And so what do you say to the 25-year-old who didn't get a four-year degree, um, mm -hmm. who thought he might follow his dad into the coal mines or maybe be a truck driver? Mm -hmm. He saw, looked around, and saw people were doing pretty well at that, but whoops, here we have you know, right. self-driving cars and trucks. Yes, and, right. And that, I think, is, that's really worrisome, I think. You well, know, it's one thing to have one generation have a rough yeah. time because it's an unusual moment in world history with China and technology. But but also, it, it seems to be the case that the, if a generation's having a tough time, it's more likely that the next generation in that same family will have a tough yeah. time. Uh, so, you know, I don't want to talk about permanent underclasses and all of that. No, that's silly. <clears throat> but... Uh, th that's the worrisome stuff. The, the inequality um, that seems beyond anyone's control. You know, but this is what the deserving poor and the undeserving poor. But uh, 
the that worries me. What worries me most about it is that conservatives seem unconcerned by it. Yeah. Uh, Democrats have all sorts of very simple income transfers. You know, we'll tax one guy, we'll give it to the other guy. Forget about whether what incentive that creates for the other guy. Right, it doesn't do uh, much it, good. I mean, it, it does, does good for him in the sense he has more money. But yeah, does but it, it doesn't. Does it doesn't do doesn't do what we want done. Right. Uh, and conservatives just, I don't know what they think, uh, but they're certainly not addressing that problem. And you see it now, in the, in this incredible debate about health care. Uh, I mean. For conservatives to sit and in one We're fell speaking in late June as the Republican alternative to Obamacare is right. faltering on the hills. So yeah, ahead. well, so, yeah. and also, we, you know, we're not, we're not, uh, don't seem concerned that at the same time we're reducing taxes on people who, yeah. are, who have benefited from being, I don't want to say that they didn't earn some of it, but there's no question that the macro economy has favored people who had assets. Capital because done, of policy. Capital is done better than labor, right? Right, right. And because of uh, a public policy, yeah. uh, which was to make asset, inflate the value of assets. Uh, I, worry about, I worry about the long-run acceptability of free market capitalism, partly because it's been the most productive system the world's ever seen, partly because it has the greatest component of freedom that the world has ever seen, and partly because no one seems to... And power seems to be addressing it. I mean, certainly uh, um, the current administration is not overly, doesn't seem overly concerned about uh, um, the, these problems. And, and the Republican leadership on the Hill, neither, which you'd think, yes. okay, the current administration has its own kind of yeah. unique problems. But not for me. I, I was actually alarmed. I will say I, I was skeptical of this from the beginning, but I wish I'd been more, in a way, uh, outspoken and and negative on it. I mean, the replacement, people are really focused on this. The Republicans campaign on repeal and replacing Obamacare, we must have published 50 pieces in yeah. favor of superior conservative tax credit based alternatives right. to Obamacare, which I think could, I think stand up fine. It never even really occurred to me, I guess, that part of repealing and replacing Obamacare was replacing, repealing all the Obamacare taxes that right. paid for Obamacare that were in the same piece of legislation. So right. it's a kind of literal matter if you repealed right. that bill. You repeal the what, three percent sur right, uh, exactly. surcharge on capital gains for people right. over two hundred fifty thousand, whatever that was, and there are a right. bunch of other things. Um, I guess, it, and, and but then you do end up with this kind of nutty, frankly, p proposal in twenty seventeen that okay, we're repealing the health care parts of Obamacare, replacing it, maybe, maybe not, but whatever, with yeah. a different system. Okay. And we're repealing all these taxes, right. which Obama, perfectly intelligently from his point of view, were made sure were taxes um, pretty much entirely on the wealthy. Right. So, but, but the wealthy have done well since Obamacare passed. Right. And right? not passed entirely in 2010. by their own effort. Right. And so you're really giving a tax break. I mean, this, yeah. not, I mean, because there's hate when you say it this way, but it is, it is empirically a correct statement. You're giving a tax break to the people who've done best over the last right. six years. I don't know Which how is you a little sell nuts. It. I mean, I, I and, and you can you see why it. this thing is crashing on yeah, the hill. Also, there's, an, there's a, a magnitude question. We're not talking about giving a tax break to people who made fifty thousand dollars a year or a hundred. We're no. talking about people who have made a lot of money, a lot of it as capital gains. Right. Uh, I hate this phrase, unearned income, but not due entirely to their own effort, but due to the Fed, yeah, uh, which inflated yeah, the value yeah, of assets. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, when I look at these rather stupid um, children who follow uh, uh, the, the new Pied Piper, um, aging Pied Piper, <coughs> the, um, you can sort of understand it. Uh, they see that's what come out of this is they owe a lot of money. Um, people who cause the, as they see it, cause the bust come out of it richer than ever, uh, and there's something wrong with that. I, have, I personally don't think there's something wrong with that, except the magnitudes. Yeah. If at the same time as you want to cut health care for poor people, you want to cut taxes on rich people, you've got to be... Uh, Unless you can make a very strong macro case that yes. this is net-net going to be wonderful for right. health care or for the and system. And almost the immediately. Yeah. That's another thing. You know, I mean, Keynes' famous statement about in the long run we're all dead uh, is certainly true. And uh, there's, again, a question not only of magnitudes, there's a question of timing. Yeah. 
And uh, again, you have to worry that the political class seems incapable of responding to this. Uh, you, you sort of wonder. Uh, if it, I think one reason that Trump got to where Trump got is because people didn't want what was going on. I mean, they'd know, I, I mean some people fell in love with Trump. Uh, but some people said there's just something inequitable about the system. Right. Uh, and so let's rattle the cage. Let's rattle the cage. Totally, yeah. and, and then we got <laughs> a cage rattler uh, who we'd probably be better off inside it than outside of it. But um, it, it, it bothers me a lot that uh, we haven't figured it out. I remember that, uh, and also at the same time, that the uh, that conservatives uh, want to make an assault on the entitlement state. Now, if I could ever think of a bad time to make an assault on the entitlement state, it's now. Um, what I wonder if conservatives who are thoughtful uh, wouldn't do now what sort of your, the deal your father said. You know, we got the new deal. For better or worse, it's there. We're not going to change it. Uh, so let's go on from there and figure it out. Now, he wouldn't go as far as, you know, the great society, but we got it. I can't see how we can reverse a lot of the perversions that have been built into the system. We bailed out the banks. Uh, go tell some poor son of a gun who can't pay his mortgage that we're sorry we can't bail you out. Right. Uh, I think we're going to have to live with what we did so far to get out of the 2008 problem and begin to build, to, to accept some sort of safety net. Um, but I'm damned if I, if I see any hope in the political system the way it is. I mean, what's interesting to me about your, what you just said is it's probably one of the more sympathetic accounts of Sanders supporters that we've had on these conversations, but I think maybe accurate. And, but also I think very importantly recognizes that Bernie Sanders in a way, it was as big a deal as Donald Trump in 2016. Yes. And they got the same number of votes in their respective primaries. Sanders was running against one candidate, so he lost, in effect, 55-45. Right. Trump was running against 16 candidates, so he got 45% of the vote and, and won. But I, I think people, especially people everywhere, but especially I mean, Trump won, so it's a much huger phenomenon, right. obviously. But the significance of that Sanders vote, most people don't appreciate right. as I think you do. And they, well, they were young people, they were just, they didn't like Hillary, they were voting some aspirational vote because no. he's an interesting, authentic guy. But I think that's, I, I think what you said is very important. I, I, th I think, and I think the same thing happened in Britain. Hmm. Uh, where, I mean, really a nutcase compared to Sanders. Corbyn, Jeremy uh, Corbyn. Jeremy Corbyn. Uh, got a huge, now he didn't get elected, but he certainly got a Came very much closer than versus, people expected. Than people expected. Uh, partly because, um, let's call it the ruling class, couldn't figure out how to adjust. And I right. think th there's something happening out there to American capitalism as we know it. It used to be you say, well, that's appropriate, they're 20 years old, you know, they're going to go out, they'll go to work, uh, and then they'll understand that you work hard and you make money. It doesn't look like that anymore to them. Right. And uh, if a... Um, so we got a demagogue as president. Right. Now, he has done some things, I think, that are useful to have done. Uh, and the people working for him are trying to do some things that are right. useful for them to do. Right. Um, but, we're, you know, I guess everybody feels that when they're living is the dangerous time. Right. Uh, and I, I don't... <laughs> I don't really think it's all that dangerous, but I think the system now is more at risk. Now, you could say when the New Deal came along, it destroyed the system it replaced, or you can say it fixed it, right. or it made it acceptable. I don't think we see the, uh, a ruling class or a set of ideas that can repair what we now, I mean, look what's gonna be on offer. We're gonna have Hillary running, we're gonna have Biden running, uh, we're going to have Trump running. I mean, this is a pretty grim prospect for a democratic society. Yeah, what happened to that generational turnover we're supposed to have? Yes, right. Uh, How much do you think the young people, young people are worried about a sense that maybe there'll just never be the kind of jobs available that there were once to 
you know, the very top tier of in, in education and connections and, and just luck and entrepreneurial scale will do fine. And maybe some, there'll always be a need for, you know, people to work mm -hmm. in hotels and hospitals yeah. and so forth. But that kind of middle tier, people do have, the, I think, maybe a worry that automation, especially in technology, really could replace a lot of these jobs in a way that's different from the earlier technological changes. Where are you on that? Are you? And the, you know, come on, every 20 years, everyone thinks technology is going to destroy jobs in ways that have never been seen before. And then, guess what? People who were working as horse, yeah. you know, driving the horse carriages end up, their kids yeah. end up, you know, I, driving I, the I, I worry about it. I'm not overwhelmingly worried about it. Um, the, the fact is, if you, if you talk to a lot of these, now you go on campuses and you talk a lot. Unfortunately, you talk to people who are pol interested in politics not getting work. Right. So, right. Uh, <clears throat> There are opportunities out there. there. It's not the kids on the college campus. It's the unskilled yeah. uh, people. And there the question is, um, do you go for a guaranteed uh, annual income? Yeah, but, uh, that, but that's uncomfortable. First yeah. of all, it makes them supplicants for their entire lives. It also and it just means they're it's like <coughs> a giant yeah. safety net. It's better than yeah. not having a safety net, but right. it's not a life so, of... So the question is, what combination of incentives uh, do you create that would make them respond to something that's productive? Uh, I, I'm less, now, you, you live in a, in a welfare state in Washington. I spend time <coughs> outside of Aspen, which is a kind of socialist where republic. Where we are now, we should Where say we are now, is. socialist republic. But you go west, uh, Minneapolis, I'm thinking of where I've gone. I don't go to Chicago, Minneapolis, uh, Phoenix, where you live, those yeah. places yeah. where I have a house. I don't like to concede that I live there yet. That's true. You live in New York, spiritually. I, spiritually, York, I'm right. in New York, right. Um, and there you don't see what you see in the East Coast. Uh, I see more people, young people, who understand the nexus between effort and result than I see in Washington, hmm. Uh, in New York, the people who understand that nexus are really way up there. Right. Uh, and for them, it's beyond describing uh, the, the level of the nexus. But um, what I see in Arizona, in New Mexico, in places I go, the young people uh, are encouraging. Uh, they, uh, they understand the, the nexus. And I'm not talking about the, the guys who put on the masks and try to bust up a meeting at Berkeley, uh, which probably may have needed busting up, I'm not sure. But certainly in the University of Arizona and, and places I go around the Midwest where I try to see what's happening. I like to go to shopping malls. I like to talk to shopkeepers. I like to meet with kids there. <clears throat> they want to uh, learn. They want to go make money. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's encouraging. Will it be difficult, more difficult than when I went to go make money? I'm not so sure. Um, is, are their aspirations greater? That is, their expectations are higher, uh, and they may be doomed to some disappointments. But uh, it's very, the most encouraging thing I do is getting out of Washington after a visit. Uh, um, where people are talking about, you know, getting a job or, you know, I, I, I said to, to one guy, would you mind moving this here? Some guy would pay to move some stuff. Oh, yeah, I do that for my grandma. Uh, well, I'm sure I like the analogy. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they're young people who, uh, <clears throat> who seem to me more to understand the relationship between effort and result than in Washington, where it's much, it's first of all much harder to determine, to discern. I mean, a guy gets elected senator. Why did he get elected senator? Because he's smart, or did he get elected senator because of who knows what? Uh, whereas, if a guy buys a new car in Phoenix, you know he didn't steal the money, or he'd be in jail if the sheriff didn't shoot him. Uh, and um, he knows he may, he got, there's some relationship between his efforts. So. That's sort of encouraging, and I, I, maybe that's the way we ought to go. Yeah. Try, sure. try to, to reconnect. Of course, the problem is at the highest levels, we've disconnected the relationship between effort and result in a lot of ways that 
including inheritance, you know, my favorite uh, big inheritances. Another, another uh, yes. conservative uh, heterodoxy that you're... Uh, well, if somebody not, tells not me what's wrong... Not in favor of zero percent death tax, right? Yeah, right. As they call it, death tax. Yes, death yes. tax, right. Inheritance As tax. if the guy who's dead can pay. You're right. Yeah. You're right. Uh, so... But, you know, just on that point, I, I think it's very interesting because, you know, one also doesn't want to romanticize the past and for no. all the effort, relationship effort and hard work in the past, there was also or hard work and results in the past. There are also a heck of a lot of people getting jobs through connections and unions and the door, right. you know, and there was a certain, uh, it was a, a system that compared, you could argue, to the current opening up of the economy, often for people not at the very top, but the right. kind of uberization, I guess you'd say, yeah. uh, getting rid of ridiculous uh, professional qualifications for barbers mm -hmm. or beauticians that really were just restraints on, on entry. entry, on right. entry. You can imagine a sort of healthy entrepreneurial, somewhat mm -hmm. entrepreneurial, but also, but not. We're not talking, you know, launching Apple, but uh, or, 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 or Microsoft, but sort of self-reliant kind of mm -hmm. attitude on the part of an awful lot of citizens. Almost more in the past when you had to be nice to the union boss to make right. to try to get yourself in the door, right? I mean, right. Well, but it, it's look, it's entirely possible. I see more uh, entrepreneurial activity when I get out of Washington uh, and, uh, and even out of New York. I mean, the entrepreneurial activity in New York's a whole other story. <clears throat> but I, uh, the guy who does my IT work is an independent. Uh, the guy who does um, uh, all sorts of maintenance, they're all independent. They all have the same problem. They can't find people and they have trouble competing with corporations who offer health care. That's the big. That's a fixable problem. That's a fixable by public problem. Policy. Maybe yeah. they should fix that instead of what they're doing. It's well, it, it certainly would increase labor mobility for right. one thing. Um, but uh, I, I, I just uh, get encouraged yeah. when I get out of there. I get then if I get to San Francisco, I get discouraged again because the street life there is horrendous. Um, but in the in the Midwest and flyover country, uh, as uh, liberals like to call it, and flyover country, uh, you do see um, uh, whole families, you do see, and, and, and to me, who went to Arizona fearful of uh, evangelical anti-Semitism, which I was taught in my household was really deadly and I ought to be careful, uh, I find out that it is a very productive uh, force uh, and the kids go to school, they're scrubbed. Not the anti-Semitism, uh, but the, no, the, not the, the, anti the religious... Uh, yeah, the anti-Semitism is more, it gets my energy more. But there, you haven't found much you were telling me. No, before, there, it's right? amazing. It's I haven't, and I'm not, now spending half my life in a town with more churches per capita than I've ever seen in my entire life. <laughs> um, and uh, it has a cohesive effect on families, and they expect kids to scrub and go to school, and they expect them to work in the summer, and they... <clears throat> you know, there's a lot of good stuff going on. And the question is maybe we should not try to develop public policy to replicate it because we screw it up, but just to let it happen. But I don't believe that. I mean, I really think. You need policies. To, you need policy to, to make it happen. And you need tax policy. You need education policy. Uh, and um, that part of it is encouraging. I get, uh, I get discouraged when I go to to towns that are having real problems because policy is so lousy, Baltimore, Chicago, right. those places. I mean, it, they're horrors by comparison. Uh, on the other hand, the rich parts of those are wonderful. Uh, so, I don't know, maybe, uh, well, if guys like you keep thinking about it, I'm sure you'll come up with something. But it does seem to be with decent education policies, decent policies that help mobility, but also help independence in a way yes and self-reliance it, it shouldn't be that hard but I do think in a weird, there is something strange now about and I find this myself I don't think I'm doing as much as creative thinking as I should be doing was there's something about Washington the contours of the debate are almost right con, are so confining and so at odds with the actual problems you need to step back and say what do we right. what do we want to achieve here in terms of society right. uh, and the country not so much what governmental you know, issue is now before us because, I don't know, right. some deadline well, or something, you know, well, because right, of the budget uh, process. I mean, we're, we're making health care policy, which is kind of a big deal, 19% of yeah. GDP, kind of important to people. Right. 
because of the budget process. Well, what well, is the budget process? Well, it's just something that some people came up with 40 years ago, which could be changed and should be well, changed. It's like and it's become, it has become inefficient and incompetent right. anyway, right? <laughs> right. Well, it's like this 10 year, you know, we're gonna look at the results of any tax policy over 10 years. Where did 10 years come from? Right. Just and so I mean, and any business leader who says, well, you know, I need stability, I have to look at, he's looking at his corporate, uh, his quarterly earnings and he's right. saying to you, you gotta extend the 10 years to 20. He knows where he's going to be in 20 years, and it ain't going to be where he's sitting now. Right, right. <clears throat> so we've, we've built, uh, I mean, one reason we can't get things done is because of the constraints we've imposed on, uh, well, you got, you know, if we do this, you need 52 votes. If you do this, you need 60 votes. Yeah. If, this, is, this is crazy. And um, I don't know what you do about it, uh, because this is the, the meat on which those Caesars feed. Uh, but it's easier to fix public policy mistakes than <clears throat> fix what, the what is the I mean, major? If the public is generally okay and the policies are wrong, that's more optimistic than the opposite. So I think. I, I, th I well, you know, we haven't had any rioting in the streets no, by I'm, anybody beyond 18 years of age right. uh, who's wearing a mask. Uh, at least they know it's not nice, so they wear a mask. Uh, we haven't had any direct assaults on the system. Even Trump, right, uh, who is. Um, sort of outside the system as we normally understand it, uh, is is outside of it in a way that's not really threatening to the system. And the system yet. and the institutions seem to be constraining him mostly yes. in a pretty good way. <clears throat> right, the courts are constraining and the... And the th but a we've lot. had six, seven years of decent economic performance. And I guess what worries yeah. me is what if we get a recession in a year or two? I mean, the 45% Sanders and 45% Trump voters are a bit of a alarm bell, perhaps fire bell in the night, and you know, what yeah. if you got a recession, what if you got a difficult war or Vietnam type situation? You could really, people could really go, and then I think the support, the thing you've been most focused on, the right. worries about the support for the system, credibility, belief in the system, and the failure to address the problems in the system, that could get dire in a way that... It, it, uh, it, but break that into two parts, right? One is foreign policy, one is domestic policy. <clears throat> foreign policy, I don't get it. I mean, it's not my field. I don't understand why 5,000 more guys are going to be able to accomplish in Afghanistan with the whole Russian army, right. which had no worry about wiping out civilians, uh, couldn't accomplish. And, um, you know, I always <clears throat> said, oh, civilians shouldn't meddle in, in military tactics. I'm now not so sure. Right. Uh, but on domestic policy, at least you know, we know the directions we should push it. Uh, what we don't know is how to make it happen. Uh, now, we're going to have an election. Um, half of me uh, used to root for uh, divided government so that nothing would happen. I think we're beyond the stage where nothing, yeah, I'm with you where nothing election, works. Yeah. I think we have to do something. Yeah. And, uh, and I think the something we have to do, among other things, is seem to be doing something. Right. Um, right. Rather than just saying. I mean, Roosevelt understood that well in the New yes. Deal, right? I mean, he, he, he figured that out early on, uh, and, and it really worked. I mean, if you think about the numbers, uh, it really worked. That's why I have to laugh at people who say the New Deal didn't work, and, you know, they write pieces about where we had high unemployment until the war started. And so the fact is, the country didn't come apart. Right. So I've decided that the way to do this, there is a surefire method is you have to elect politicians who you have seen laugh. Uh, Reagan laughed, Roosevelt laughed. I don't think I ever saw Hillary Clinton laugh. I mean, cackle, yes, uh, <laughs> laugh, no. Uh, politicians who have enough of a vision beyond themselves to not take themselves as seriously as some do. <clears throat> I mean, Roosevelt is my model. I mean, he, he had a bad deck of cards to play with. Uh, and you could say, well, sure, he fixed it with a war. Um, he didn't start the war, I'm sorry right. to tell his critics. Right. He didn't start the war. And I think what conservatives have to do now is say, okay, here's where we are. Right. We're not, look, Barack Obama won. People with pre-existing conditions are gonna get health care, and they're not gonna pay for it. They're not gonna pay anything like what the actuarial tables say they should pay. Okay. Right. So what That's do do it. Right. Good. Let's accept that. Then what do we do about it? How do we make that uh, as least costly as possible and as most efficient as possible? Uh, 
take the cards we've got, which are not bad cards. I mean, the fact is, we have a healthcare system that's very expensive, but we have a, company that's, a country that's very rich. Uh, so if we spend part another 1% of our marginal income on healthcare, so what? Uh, it's, not, it's not like it's coming out of the people's mouths. I mean, it's, it's, we're talking now about uh, replacing essentially all your body parts before you die right, right. Uh, so that you, you are a bionic man by the time you die. Uh, that's fine with me. I mean, if anybody wants it, they're welcome to it. Uh, and um, we're talking about uh, trying to get a system that um, enables us to afford that, that is productive enough to enable us to afford what it is that keeps the system going. And yeah, people, and um, do we have an inflated- And freedom and yes. individual and Do we have an inflated view of entitlements? Yes, and the people who complain most about it are the most entitled. Uh, so I think we have to ignore them. Uh, we have to figure out, as a body politic, what are the reasonable entitlements. Uh, and then try to deliver them, that's where economists can help, in an efficient way. Right. If you look at Britain with the NHS, it's a horribly inefficient system. It's got moral hazard, it's got every wrong thing, bad incentives, and so on. Try to get the incentives right. Try to limit moral hazard. Try to keep a nose sniffing for blatant inequalities that even if that's what the market produces, listen to Adam Smith, you know, just intervene. Uh, I, I particularly like when he talked about, when he talks about trade policies for free trade, and then when he gets to, well, what if the other guy is doing that? He said, well, revenge. <laughs> he uses the word revenge. One sentence, revenge. Uh, it's appropriate. Uh, why not? Will we survive Trump? Yeah, I mean, we're a great country. We'll survive Trump. I, I don't doubt that for a minute. Um, is it a bit unnerving, sure, but has it got Germany increasing its defense expenditures? Right, right. Yeah, so. And the problems are deeper than Trump, as you've been saying. And the problems, and, and we, I mean, Trump is a needs, symptom. That's what needs to be addressed. Is the the pro and, and, but that's, that's the weakness. I mean, we're not doing that. We're not, uh, now you're more familiar with the think tank world than I am, but I follow it some. Uh, but I worry that, that we're not doing that. And People are getting there. I think it's a little bit of an adjustment, and you know, this, there's always a lag, but I, I kind of feel like people are coming to where you are in terms of thinking in a broader sense of political economy and trying to step back from the particular narrow debates of the last few years and mm -hmm. last decade maybe and really try to say, okay, what, what do we accept? What are the cards we have? What can we fix? What, we, what do we just live with? And mm -hmm. it's perfectly tolerable. But, let's, yeah. but also I think the notion, this is where I think you're so – what you've been saying is so important. I mean, think in terms of the system as a whole, of you know the system of the democratic capitalism, political liberty, you know, a certain amount of economic equity, but also growth. I mean, that's the right way to ask. Those are the questions we have to ask, not this very right. narrow. You promise to repeal this, and therefore, right. you've got to right. help people making more than a million dollars a year with their capital gains taxes. Yeah, I, th I think, and we also have to recognize that a lot of the things. We thought we knew. We don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, well, we knew. We, them we, at we the know time. that making more money is an incentive, right? Yeah. But we don't know at what magnitude it stops being an incentive. Right. And also, things we knew <coughs> that were correct in 1983 may not be right. correct in 2017. That's well, just that, the that's the one problem conservatives have is that this Reagan love. Yeah. I mean, you know, Reagan was wonderful and all of that, and that was then, and this is now, uh, and um, we now have different family structures. We have to, but. This is a this is a great country. I mean, we you know we, uh, we can't what to sell it short. I hate that expression, but somehow uh, you've got to go back there and persuade people to think again, uh, because what they're doing now is is kind of a mindless process. I mean, we'll go around the room and everybody will say hello. I mean. Thinking again maybe is a big task, but I'll, uh, I'll okay, do my well, best. And you'll do your best, and, well, and hopefully this With you in charge, I'm relaxed. And with this conversation, I hope, with this conversation, I hope we'll help people think again. Erwin, thanks very well, much for thank taking you for this having time me. Uh, to join me. And thank you for joining us on Conversations.